Hi, this is 911. You have an emergency? Okay, I'm on a sailboat out off of uh, South Daytona, and a boat just floated by me, and a girl jumped out of it and swam over and called my ding and said people been beating on her. Okay, how long? Oh, uh, wait a minute. A boat, wait a minute. A boat is coming to, just a minute. There's a boat. Do you want to go with these people or not? Okay. Hey, guys, she ain't going with you. She's going into the park to meet the police. In the simmering heat of a typical Florida summer, the city of Daytona Beach gleamed like a gem on the Atlantic coast. Known for its legendary Daytona International Speedway and sprawling, sun-kissed beaches, the destination was a haven for thrill-seekers and sun-worshippers alike. Neon lights flickered in the bustling beachfront bars and restaurants, inviting locals and tourists to indulge in the city's lively nightlife. Yet, beneath the surface of this idyllic coastal paradise, a sinister undercurrent was about to emerge, one that would shock the community to its core and challenge the acumen of the city's finest detectives. As the sun dipped below the horizon, casting long shadows over the streets, an ominous sense of foreboding settled over Daytona Beach. Little did its residents know that they were on the cusp of a chilling chapter in their city's history. Let's dive in. Crystal Carolea Guest, born on December 23, 1986 in Barnstable, Massachusetts, was a New England native who soon found her home in the sunnier climes of central Florida. After relocating southward with her mother, Crystal spent the majority of her life in this vibrant and sunny region. She was a familiar face in New Smyrna Beach and later made her home in Daytona Beach. Her school years were spent walking the halls of New Smyrna Beach High School, where she was beloved by her peers. Her family members described her as warm, loving, and fiercely protective of her loved ones, sometimes to her own detriment. In the early 2000s, Crystal embarked on a new chapter in her life, entering into matrimony and setting the stage for the subsequent events that would unfold in her life. The Pfeifers welcomed a baby boy into their lives in June 2005, marking a joyful beginning for the young family. But their happiness was abruptly overshadowed on October 1, 2005. While their infant son was resting in his bouncy chair, a tragic accident occurred. A piece of furniture toppled over, causing severe injury to the infant. The boy sustained a fractured upper jaw and palate, along with mid-facial trauma. In a race against time, he was urgently transported to Arnold Palmer Hospital in Orlando. There, he underwent emergency surgery and began a lengthy recovery process. During his hospitalization, he was nourished through tube feeding until it was safe to remove the tracheostomy and his injuries had sufficiently healed. After an intense 16-day hospital stay, he was finally discharged. This incident mirrored a worrying trend noted by the Center for Injury Research. Between 1990 and 2007, an estimated 264,200 children were victims of furniture tip-over accidents. Over the years, Crystal's son needed further medical treatments, and she devoted herself to ensuring his well-being, making it her foremost priority. Professionally, Crystal had stable employment as an office manager at a car towing business in Holly Hill, a position she held for a decade. To the contrary, her personal life faced challenges. In 2009, her first marriage came to an end with a divorce. Undeterred, Crystal later entered into a second marriage, but this too hit troubled waters. In December 2012, she filed for the dissolution of her second marriage, a process which concluded in March 2013. Unfortunately, the difficulties with her second husband did not end with the divorce. A mere 16 months later, Crystal found herself in a position where she needed to file for an order of protection against him, indicating ongoing turmoil in her personal life. Following the collapse of her two previous marriages, Crystal was understandably cautious about re-entering the dating scene. Nonetheless, her perspective changed when she met Thomas Prinz, a 42-year-old entrepreneur originally from Hoboken, New Jersey.
When Crystal met Thomas Prinz, he had lived in Volusia County for more than 15 years and owned a landscaping business. Despite the 14-year age difference, her family warmly accepted Thomas, raising hopes that he might be the stable and mature partner Crystal longed for. Their relationship progressed quickly, and court records show that Crystal moved into Thomas's home in Daytona Beach. But the initial optimism was short-lived. Just seven months into their relationship, red flags began to surface. Police records and accounts from neighbors paint a picture of a tumultuous relationship, marked by recurring arguments that were loud enough to draw attention and frequent police encounters. In fact, Daytona Beach police say officers responded to their home at least a dozen times for domestic disturbance calls. One such incident occurred on March 21, 2015. Any West End unit for a 960? All units, 25. Goal, domestic assault. On the night of March 21st, 2015, police arrived at Crystal and Thomas's shared residence for a report of a disturbance. As detailed in an arrest affidavit, Thomas told the responding officers that an altercation began when Crystal came home late in the evening. He claimed he expressed his concern to her, saying, I would have liked the call to make sure you were okay. In response, Crystal allegedly threw a dinner plate from the sink at Thomas, hitting him in the head. Following this, Thomas left the residence to call 911. During this time, Crystal's brother and father arrived and reportedly became physically aggressive towards Thomas. However, when asked to identify them, Thomas said he could not recall their names. Despite the incident, Thomas did not want to press charges and declined to provide a written statement to the police. He reported no injuries and refused medical attention. Consequently, Crystal was arrested and charged with misdemeanor assault. The prosecutors later dropped these charges due to the witness's lack of cooperation. Before this incident, Crystal had no history of violent behavior. On the other hand, Thomas's past was marred by a substantial criminal history with at least eight arrests for charges including domestic violence and child abuse dating back to 2006. It is unclear if Crystal was aware of these charges. Despite the stormy dynamics of their partnership, Crystal kept the ongoing abuse by Thomas a secret, striving to maintain a facade of normalcy in order to protect her family. With a determined effort to appear content and move beyond their troubles, Crystal and Thomas attempted a fresh start on the evening of August 11th, they chose to dine together at a local Riverside restaurant, hoping to leave their turbulent history in the past and start anew. Nine one one, where's the emergency? There's a body floating out off of a dock here. Um, it just came up on it when we were fishing. Jeans and no shirt, and looks like he's got bruises on his like his shoulders and stuff. On August 11th, 2015, Thomas and Crystal planned an evening that combined dining at a local Riverside restaurant with a leisurely boat ride on the Halifax River in Port Orange. Their intention was to enjoy dinner before spending a few hours on the water. However, the night took an unexpected turn right from the start. At the restaurant, the couple's intense displays of affection led to them being asked to leave. After being escorted out, the couple, with Crystal in denim shorts and a bikini top, headed to the marina to embark on Thomas's boat for the next part of their evening. Yet, it wasn't just their public affection that raised eyebrows that night. Patrons at the restaurant sensed something amiss, particularly with Crystal's situation. One observant patron, increasingly concerned for her safety, decided to take action. Recognizing the seriousness of what might be unfolding, this patron began recording the events on his cell phone capturing key moments of the interaction between Thomas and Crystal. This guy's going to plow and then every boat on this dock. Maybe we're lucky it won't start. Something's right. going to happen here. Oh, there it goes. Here we go. Here we go. Turn the lights on! Turn the lights on! Turn the lights on! Turn the lights on! As Thomas and Crystal sailed away into the night, their departure left onlookers at the marina fearing what might transpire next. That fear turned into reality just after midnight when Thomas suddenly called 911. 911, 
Me and uh, me and my fiance got in a little bit of an argument, and uh, she took the keys to my boat and jumped off the boat. And uh, I just want to make sure she's okay. You don't see her in the water. I I don't see her in the water. I'll take one for sure. She's not that good of a swimmer. I keep on jumping in the water to see if I can find her, and I can't find her anywhere. Crystal. Is she responding to you? No. Okay. You don't see her on the shore, though? No, no. She took the boat. She said, I hate you, and she jumped in the water and swam off. And I'm, I'm just praying that she's okay. How long ago did this happen? Uh, Not even five minutes ago. Maybe uh, ten minutes ago. Crystal! Police and an emergency rescue crew were summoned to Thomas's location. They escorted him to safety but had no luck finding Crystal. Hours later, at around 7 a.m., a fisherman at the Seven Seas Marina and Boatyard in Port Orange stumbled upon a frightening scene. Shocked by what he discovered, he immediately called 911 to report the grisly find. 911, where's the emergency? There's a body floating out off of a dock here. Um, it just came up on it when we were fishing. Jeans and no shirt, and looks like he's got bruises on his, like, his shoulders and stuff. Detectives from the Port Orange Police Department arrived on the scene and sought to determine whether the body discovered was that of Crystal Pfeiffer. An autopsy was arranged for the following morning, and police offered no additional details at that time. Roughly one hour after the fisherman's 911 call, Thomas contacted Crystal's mother to inform her that her daughter was missing. She observed Thomas's tone as flat and unemotional. Crystal's mother immediately gathered her family and contacted local police to assist. The following day, police received information that the medical examiner's office identified the body as that of Crystal Pfeiffer. Further, there were more than 30 injuries sustained. There was no evidence of water in her lungs or other signs consistent with drowning. Instead, there was a ligature mark around her neck. The cause of death was asphyxiation by ligature, and the manner of death was homicide. Acting on this information, detectives requested that the last known person to see her alive, Thomas Prince, come down to the police station for questioning. Upon arrival, Thomas waived his Miranda rights and agreed to be questioned by detectives without an attorney present. And I'm like, baby, are you kidding me? I'm like, it'll start up with a there, and then uh, that was it. I kept on hearing her swimming, and then uh, I didn't hear nothing. And then that's when I waited about like maybe 10 minutes, and then called her call and uh, I went well. Hey, listen, we're going to have an action. You got an action? Run? Is that what you said? No, I said that I said that me and my girl got into an argument. Oh, okay. I'm not, I'm not going to have I have a feeling the argument on the boat was a little bit more elaborate than what you described. I mean, we, we powwowed and argued back and forth. I mean, like you said, we powwowed and uh, yelled and not just it was loud and stuff, but uh, I mean, there's nothing physical, nothing to that Extent. Yeah. 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 Would you mind if I just look to see if you have any marks or anything? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I can work on that. Get a scratch up. I'm going to get a scratch up. I'm going to get a scratch up. Absolutely. You want to take over, sir? Yeah, I'm sure you guys didn't get physical. No, they were pretty hard. Did they grab you or? No, no, not at all. It was not, nothing to that point at all. Did you want anything else to get open when you got back? No, I'm going to just grab the clothes off there and take the towels and the clothes and stuff. Were they? He didn't have all on the floor when I threw it in the washing machine with my clothes. So you did the laundry when you got home? 
Just so I'm um, just so I end up uh, yeah. So a current thing where a body goes on the river. Yeah. Who do you got here? No. No. Um he's praying that I'm not I mean not that I wanted to wish on anybody in some of them praying about Chris Well I hate to break it to you, but it is first. I think you already knew that. It is Chris. There's a little more that has in that book class than what you're telling me. She has some injuries. Not a couple, but a bunch. But what other injuries that we should talk to about? What else has The evidence suggests, from what we know so far, yeah. that there is a physical altercation to a place. You were the last person with her. And you have those scratches on your right arm, your forearm, you got bruises on your left arm, scratches on your back. Looking on your leg. I think it was uh, last night when I ended up slipping down by the dock when I was pulling the boat up. There was a bunch of bruises on her. Right. I mean, Could I got something when she jumped in the water? I don't know. No. Why are you going do that to you? She looks like she went a couple of rounds with Mike Tyson. And you're telling me that nothing physical took place. There was nothing physical that took place on the boat. I mean, we had, had like three times on the boat and stuff, but. Uh, but I not to a point of something like that section went to force we thought about it. Yeah. And not I'm not sex that. or anything like that. No, I mean don't get me wrong. I mean we uh we grab each other and share about my bus. What? When we were having sex? Oh uh, no. No. Not last night. You I mean at one around at that point. No. No. At uh at one point in stuff we did uh uh I'm trying to think like when we were sitting over the chair and stuff. I did and the dog grabbed me right some over uh, by the shoulders probably. Uh, no, kinda of like by your neck and the shoulders area and stuff. Where my oh it's where my uh thing is what it been like right there, but not to uh let me see, not to a point where we were hurting one another. I got a couple of photos here. Okay. Um if you wanna take a look at them? Are you have crystal? These are these are the bruises that are on her face. From what? From her hitting something? That's what we're here to find out, Thomas. See the lines around the net? You know what that's called? What that appears to be? What does that appear to be? The luggage report. Okay, it's called like a rover. Why is it really easy? Oh, a bathing suit with the. Uh, did you wash it? No, like she originally had um, a bathing suit top on um, uh, 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 her chin. She was punched. She, she was punched multiple times. Okay, well, it definitely wasn't by Her yeah. knuckles are swollen. The only thing that explains these marks is an altercation between her and somebody else. And that somebody else, I think, was you. I mean, am I being charged with anything? Not at the moment. Detectives released Thomas while they worked on strengthening their case. In the process of piecing together the events of the evening, they conducted interviews with witnesses and restaurant patrons who had observed Crystal and Thomas engaged in an argument at the Dockside restaurant shortly before 8 p.m. on the night of Crystal's death. As the investigation progressed, detectives came across a crucial lead. A fisherman had witnessed a severe altercation involving the couple around 10.45 p.m. that same night, prompting him to call 911. Hi, this is 911. Do you have an emergency? Okay, I'm on a sailboat out off of uh, South Daytona, and a boat just floated by me, and a girl jumped out of it and swam over and called my ding and said people been beating on her. Okay, how long? Oh, uh, wait a minute, a boat. Wait a minute, a boat is coming to. Just a minute, there's a boat. Do you want to go with these people or not? Okay. Hey guys, she ain't going with you. She's going into the park to meet the police. She ain't going with you. Did she look okay. hurt? Uh, she told me they were beating her in the face and stuff. I don't know. I can't see her. It's dark down there. But these guys are here yelling and screaming. Well, look, I got a mentally handicapped daughter on board here with me. Who is this guy to her? She says it's your boyfriend. He's not following you, is he? No, he's just standing out off the road here saying, come on, come on. Okay. He's going on. Uh, she just jumped in the water. Are you going back to his boat? Nobody's gonna hurt anybody. Okay. I'm coming back over to the boat because she's afraid he'll hurt my daughter. 
Is that Bert screaming? Yeah, she's screaming at him. They're drifting north. Okay. He said she kept punching her in the head and, he, and she and that he hurt her hand. She's back at the boat. Is she is she back on the boat or Yep, she's back on the boat and they got all their lights out now. Can you hear them yelling? No. Now they're all of a sudden they're being really quiet. A little over an hour later, Thomas placed a 911 call to report Crystal as missing. Yet it was the call made by the fisherman, George Wagner, one hour earlier that proved to be the last puzzle piece. This crucial element helped detectives to complete their understanding of the events of that night. According to a report from the South Daytona Police Department, the situation began with a violent assault by Thomas on his boat, prompting Crystal to jump into the water in an attempt to flee. She successfully swam to Wagner's boat and sought help. However, realizing that her presence might endanger Wagner's daughter, Crystal chose to return to Thomas's vessel, a decision marked by both courage and concern for others. Despite her return, the argument between Crystal and Thomas continued. It tragically escalated to the point where Thomas strangled Crystal with her own bikini top. Following this, he disposed of her body in the Halifax River. The sequence of these events culminating in the 911 call made by Thomas, painted a grim picture of the night's events for the investigators. Thomas was arrested on October 27, 2015, and held without bond pending trial. He was charged with first-degree premeditated murder and made his first court appearance the following day. Uh, in your case, sir, uh, you have been indicted by a grand jury on a charge of first-degree murder. The Campagnolo family wore justice for Crystal shirts today as they sat in court watching their daughter's boyfriend, 42-year-old Thomas Prince, being charged with first-degree murder. We liked him, our grandson liked him, and that's why Crystal kept going back to her. I found out that because her, grand, her son liked him, and, and he asked me, he says, did Tommy hurt my mom? And I said, no, no, and uh, he goes, oh, good, because I liked him. Authorities say they were investigating whether Piper's death was related to a disturbance call from the night before at the South Daytona ramp. Police say Piper jumped off Prince's boat onto another man's boat for help, claiming Prince was beating on her. The man called 911, but police say Piper jumped back into Prince's boat before help arrived. Her body found in the Halifax River the next morning. Well, after the fact, you know, people have told us about domestic abuse between the two of them, but no one has said anything until after she had passed, and I wish people would have spoke up. The family says they knew Prince abused Piper once before, but didn't know it was ongoing. They tell News 6 they saw marks on Piper's body after she was found, but still have questions. Knowing what, how she died and, and what killed her, because, you know, we always wonder, was she calling for us, needing help? Uh, could she have made it to shore, or was she, did she die before she hit the water? She got him. What they do know is that they're one step closer to justice being served. In June 2016, following a six-hour deliberation, the jury delivered their verdict in the case against Thomas Prinz, finding him guilty of first-degree murder for the death of his girlfriend, Crystal Pfeiffer. The gravity of the verdict was too much for Prinz. He collapsed in the courtroom, visibly overwhelmed by the outcome. Due to his sudden medical crisis, he was immediately taken to an on-site medical office for treatment, prompting the judge to postpone the sentencing. The courtroom was subsequently cleared in the wake of this unexpected turn of events. Five days later, the case reached its conclusion. Thomas Prinz was sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. This sentence marked the end of a profoundly sorrowful story, offering Crystal's family and friends a sense of justice in their grief. For them, Crystal's memory continues to be a beacon, embodying hope and resilience, shining light even through the darkest moments. <laughs>